Zero. Aloha and welcome to this show, the state of the state of Hawaii on the Think Tech Hawaii live streaming network series. Think Tech Hawaii broadcasts from our studio at 1164 Bishop Street uh, at the core of downtown Honolulu. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Today, our guest is Dr. Ronald Gallimore, an emeritus UCLA professor and former University of Hawaii psychology professor. In this interview, we will tell a story from the early days of Hawaii statehood. When the young state started on its path to become a nationally acclaimed research center on minority education issues. That took a while to do, but it did take us there. The story we discuss today is about the first step on that path. It came about with changes in state political leadership and the new goals set for all the state's citizens' welfare. These conditions led to an ambitious education project for the time, and it was to know more about how to help Hawaiian students succeed in the state's public schools. One way to proceed was to study the problem, and indeed, a study was supported by prominent leaders and educators and numerous agencies such as the Kamehameha Schools, Bishop of State, Bishop Museum, and other local agencies. My guest, Dr. Ron Gallimore, and his research colleagues at the time were tasked by the Bishop of State trustees to conduct a Leeward Coast study of Hawaiian community and culture. Uh, Dr. Gallimore is most qualified to discuss this first step, the beginnings of what will be a success story, and especially he can tell us about the challenges and the findings and steps to success in the process of improving Hawaiian students' performance in the state's public schools. Welcome, Dr. Gallimore, and thank you for joining us today for this interview conversation. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and I hope for the rest of our uh, discussion, you'll call me Ron. I'd feel a lot younger if you did. Thank you. I had that as my next, as my first question. <laughs> I said, okay, to call you Ron. Good. We've known each other for a long time um, as this work, as our, <laughs> our capacity to talk about this work together uh, shows. So um, I think that um, you are the one to help us remember what that work was that, that this state took on and, and succeeded with and became uh, prominent for, for it. Um, but I'd like to know, and if you're willing to talk about it, and certainly it seems like a good place to start about how you got involved with this work when you came to Hawaii. I'm not sure that you came to Hawaii for this work, but that's interesting too. So if you could tell us how you did get involved. Well, I'll start with a quick, uh, personal anecdote. Uh, I got a PhD in clinical psychology from Northwestern in 1964 and was appointed assistant professor of psychology at Cal State Long Beach. And um, this is in the middle of the civil rights movement. And I was like many young people at the time quite involved in trying to uh, solve some of the problems that had arisen in the history of our and on weekends, I would uh, volunteer at a local community organization in the African-American community of Long Beach, which was quite a large one. And during the week, I taught psychology classes. And after a few months of volunteering in a tutoring and head start center, I, I quickly noticed that my preparation as a psychology researcher had not prepared me to um, conduct research in a community setting uh, uh, that involved African Americans. I complained to my graduate school advisor, who at the time was on sabbatical in Hawaii, and gotten to know Alan Howard, who was an anthropologist at the university and at the Bishop Museum. And within a few months, my wife and infant daughter and I were on a plane to Honolulu 
I'd left my job in Long Beach. And the next thing we knew, we were living in a rented house on Farrington Highway in YNI, where I spent the next two years working with families and uh, individuals in Nanakuli. And the reason I wanted to do that was I, I wanted to work with anthropologists and I wanted an opportunity to, um, to learn how to broaden my uh, ability to work in communities that were different from my own. Although I'd grown up in a, uh, Tucson, Arizona with many uh, Mexican-American friends and uh, classmates, uh, this was my first exper uh, experience asked to do research in a community other than the one from which I came. Well, what, now, what, this opportunity. Yeah, I, yes, go ahead. I was going to ask was what were the issues, yeah, at the time, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, well, uh, when I was working in the African American community, I noticed that the students who came to the tutoring center to help us repair the building were extraordinarily competent and able and could learn all sorts of things about painting and carpentry, and, and they had a marvelous uh, uh, ability to speak and express themselves. But as soon as they were putting in classes or tu tutoring, it, it was obvious there was this huge discrepancy between how well they could perform in the one setting and the other. And that's what I wanted to learn to do. And eventually, when I did get to Donakuli and worked in the community, I saw the same thing. Native Hawaiian students uh, at school struggled, but if you were in the homes and saw the kind of responsibilities and abilities that they had, it was a remarkable contrast. So it seemed obvious to me that somehow or other, those strengths and those capacities that you saw at home and in the neighborhoods had to be somehow taken advantage of in the schools. And that, that was the issue. And in some respect, it's the one we still confront. But the how I got to Hawaii, uh, that was my interest, but the opportunity was created by people like Myron Pinky Thompson and other leaders of the Hawaiian community in the early 60s. Well, that was who, my uh, question. Through their how, efforts. So. Yeah, how did, how did it get started that you had a place to go and do this study, as you say, with other um, anthropologists? So how did, I mean, here you all were out on the, on the Makaha beaches. So how, how, did that, how did that site get set okay. up for this serious work on these issues of Hawaii? Students' education, Hawaiian youngsters' education. Yeah. In the early in the early '60s, right after statehood, Pinky Thompson and other leaders formed a committee. It was called the Lilio Kalani uh, Research Committee, and all of the major organizations that were concerned with the Hawaiian people, and by that I mean the Native Hawaiian people, the original inhabitants of the island and their descendants. Uh, they put together this committee, and they began to research the circumstances and discovering, as we most people would understand, things were not very good in some of those communities. The education performance was low, there were health issues, and so forth. Uh, the committee uh, decided that they wanted to do an in-depth study of a single community, and they chose Nanakuli. They then recruited the Bishop Museum, and Alan Howard, an anthropologist, and uh, Pinky Thompson and Alan Howard successfully obtained funding from a national foundation to launch the Nanakuli Community Project. And that's the point at which I was given the opportunity to come to Hawaii, uh, along with Kathy Jordan, who was a graduate student at the university, and Joanne and Steve Boggs, both anthropologists, who uh, joined the, uh, the uh, project. So that was the original team. Well, now, was that federal funding that was a grant? A grant? Where was that original grant from? It was a, it was federal research funding from one of the National Institute of Health. Oh yes, okay, and, good, uh, good, yeah. They yeah. provided they provided the funding. It was a competitive grant process mm -hmm. that Allen and Pinky succeeded in uh, achieving. And then uh, at the end of the initial funding, Allen and I were able to get it uh, extended for a couple of years. So the project actually lasted a full five years. Well, good. Well, then um, I wanted to ask um, why the work was important. Maybe it would help to know what were the 
research questions you were asking in the grant well, somehow tell us that yeah. in the in, in the 19 if we roll back to the 1960s now we're talking you know 50 some years ago or more yeah. there was a big dispute going on whether or not communities like those that of, of Nanakuli were the problems caused by uh, people lacking the qualities to be successful or were the problems structural that is people didn't have the opportunity so there was a raging and it still goes on to some extent but not so out in the open as it was in the 60s so this this for example would mean when children come to school and they're not successful is it you know are we going to blame the parents or are we going to try to figure out ways at the school to help the children succeed and an educator once said well the parents are sending us their best children so we need to figure out how to help them. So one of the driving forces behind the Nanakuli community study was to learn about the qualities of Hawaiian family life and culture, child rearing practices, and to uh, discover the strengths that were uh, present in that community and then use those to build a better program. For example, better healthcare Mm -hmm. uh, or education or any number of other uh, uh, job training mm -hmm. but not go in and assume well these people are missing a lot of stuff and we've got to bring it to them as opposed to let's meet them halfway might be another way to put it well i was going to ask you that what your expectations were uh truly from having had your experience already in California with other minority students. So that's what I want to, so, so this not bringing them, you're not, you weren't there with the government money to help them. You were there to learn about them, right? Or uh, yeah, basically, so tell us about yeah. that, because that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I mean, you could say we, you know, what we were gonna basically do is say, listen to what the people had to say and then help carry those messages back to the policymakers and the practitioners as opposed to us coming and telling them what to do as researchers that would be our job is to is to listen and learn and not impose our own views on it now i, I i'm sure i'm guilty of having done some of that and, and anybody that watches this and goes back and reads the old stuff that was published 50 years ago they might catch me out but i will gladly say that no one is perfect when it is, but our intentions was to were, our intentions were to listen and 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 reflect back accurately what we learned about the community. Let me tell you a funny anecdote. Two days after I arrived in Hawaii for the first time, and we, Alan and I, went to the Nanakuli, and they were preparing for the major annual luau, and uh, they put on on July the fourth, the Ray Scholarship Month. The community I, I think might still be doing that i don't know anyway after i was there working in the sun helping out getting ready uh they were practicing people were uh, women were practicing the hula on a stage for the performance that would be done the next day and soon i was being uh asked to get up and dance a hula well you know my first i said no no way i i'm not doing that you know i'm a researcher well, of course, I gave in. I got up there, and uh, I was surrounded by some elderly kapunas who were dancing around me. And you know, I I learned very quickly that I had to take all that in good humor. So one of the things I learned was, you know, don't don't go into Nanakulian with a stuck-up high nose, or uh, you're not going to get accepted. So. <laughs> yeah, Maybe well, in that one little thing you illustrated what what I I learned within two days of my first uh, my first experience in Hawaii. Become but part those, of the culture, uh, yes. Well, did but did we you... had a we had a, quite a big team, you know, Steve and Joanne and Kathy and Alan and others that uh, I could name that, and we tried to look at a, a wide range of things in the community, and there were some major findings. Well, I wanted uh, to ask then. You know, how actually did that go? I mean, was everybody, um, because this is 50 years ago, okay? So there were uh, diverse views about how all of these things worked and what culture was and how communities get things done. So how did, how did that all go 
with in with doing the very research that was to go in and to listen and to question. I mean, certainly right. there was a bit of chaos you had to organize, just chaos of the or, of the ordinary, getting things to people to sit down and talk and listen. How how did that go? Well, we 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 tried different. Uh, uh, ways to get at it. So we use what we we'd call uh, multi methods. So we did a household survey of all 396 households at the time on the Nanakuli homestead. Literally a survey. Somebody went in and asked a series of questions. It's kind of like a census. And, uh, we also um, conducted systematic interviews with mothers who had children at the preschool. We interviewed uh, 100 adolescents uh, at the Waianae High School, all, all of whom were from Nanakuli. Um, we, each of us who worked on the team had a family or so we spent a lot of time with and became principal, what we would call principal informants. And we would go to them and say, hey, we've been, you know, people are telling us this. And we would try to uh, pull together from all of these different sources of information a common uh, interpretation of what was going on. Now, for example, one of the findings was the extent to which the families in Nanakuli uh, uh, used what we called sibling caretaking. That is, well, children in these households, there were often you know, three, four children. The older children were given major responsibilities for caring for their younger siblings, household duties, cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry. And many of the families felt this was a very important uh, um, responsibility uh, training and preparation for adulthood. Uh, that would be one of the major findings. The other is um, the uh, rather remarkable fluency of the parents and the younger children, the ability to tell stories in very colorful and detailed ways. That would be an example of one of the strengths that wasn't being fully taken advantage of in the public schools. And uh, if we get time later, we could talk about some of the educational research that went on. Yeah, well that, I wondered, um, how did the people, I mean, this must have been the first study to have been done, I mean, I mean, maybe there had been others, but certainly it would have been a novel experience for everyone. So what about the rapport issues um, between you know, you research search people. Well, now, it, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, we're talking now in the 1960s, but we found the community for the most part very receptive. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no, um, I, I don't recall that people were suspicious of us from, although we did learn later that there was a smaller, small group that thought we were, you know, from the government and yeah. um, that they were uh, traditionally Republican. And at the time it was a Democratic administration in Washington and they were a little more suspicious of us, we heard, but I never encountered any. Thing. There, was, there was certainly some misunderstandings at the time. One time the newspaper, one of the local newspapers had a headline about our study that said, study blames culture for poor students. Oh, well, right. <laughs> we, it, it, I had been interviewed and I had said the exact opposite. I said, well, the schools could probably benefit by taking advantage of cultural strengths. But that somehow in the headline got turned into yeah. something. I, Alan well, what, and I were called into a meet, public community meeting at the Nana Ikapono Auditorium. And uh, we had to stand on the stage and explain ourselves. Well, you were pleasant. yeah, and it must have been explaining about culture and understanding of it. Was that one of the the learnings or understandings that came out of that work? I mean that that I mean there was at that time some real confusion about what yeah. culture was and yeah. how that functioned. Right, and you know, and well, and we and, uh, well, I think one of the ben uh, the values of that was and the notion that there was. In Nanakuli, there was a robust culture operating among the families and in the community. Of course, there's problems. You know, every community has its problems. But the notion that the problems of Nanakuli were the result of, um, you know, no family values is nonsense. Yeah. These families had very mm -hmm. strong values and they were doing 
things according to their own cultural uh, practices and hopefully we help communicate that a little bit. Well, let's talk a little bit about then what the what the study findings are. I know that there are books and articles and reams of uh, notes on, on this, but maybe um, you could talk about meaningful, that the, the most uh, meaningful findings for a general audience like ours rather than a, a researcher person. Well, we, uh, when we started, education was not a particular focus. It was more family life, community life, uh, child rearing practices. But in the community, the more I got involved with this issue that the, the, the students at school were struggling but at home, I would observe the same kids uh, doing remarkable things. So uh, Scott McDonald, another psychologist who was in working in the area at the time, and I started some small scale work at Nana Ikupono School, which at the time was uh, K-8. Mm -hmm. And it was a very large campus and quite crowded. And students were struggling in reading and math and, the, and so forth. And so we started taking referrals from teachers who were having problems and we would go to the classroom and we observe and, and talk to the teachers and talk to the kids. And out of that, about two years of sideline research, this wasn't part of the main community study, we uh, confirmed what I had been thinking all along. The same students or the same children who at home were competent and learning and doing all these things. Um, at school, we're struggling. And that just doesn't make sense. You know, you can't, if a person's competent, they're competent. It doesn't matter. The settings would matter. So that then made us look and realize that some of the teachers at Nano Yukapuna were very effective. Now, many of them were very young teachers because it wasn't a desirable place. And many of them were recruited from the mainland, and they came for maybe a year. And many were younger uh, uh, island taught or trained teachers, but they wanted to be in Honolulu. So you had a lot of young teachers, a lot of turnover. And that was a problem. But there were some very effective ones. So we took some notes and tried to understand why these more effective teachers were being successful. But we ran into this problem. You know, the life of a public school teacher, an elementary, middle school teacher, and high school teachers, I mean, it's, it's a crushingly hard job if you're trying at all. You know, you're with students all day long. You gotta prepare lessons. You gotta grade papers. You have to attend, you know, necessary uh, administrative functions, meet with parents. Um, some teachers have to take additional coursework. So the life is a hard one. So here come a couple of you know, bright-eyed, young researchers and they want to try out all this new stuff and you know it takes time it's going to take time and energy and there's just not a lot left over and there was no support of course uh, we yeah. didn't have any money to support research like that and uh, here's what <laughs> one one day uh, you know I was full of all these ideas I wanted to try out and I was in the parking lot in Nana Ikapono and the about to become president of Kamehameha Schools, Jack Garble, he was going to become president in about a year or so, and said, hey, Ron, you know, I know you all have been doing this research out here for a few years. You got any suggestions for, you know, the Kamehameha Schools? We want to reach out and help more Hawaiian children throughout the state. You got any ideas? And I said, well, yeah, you know, Jack, we do have ideas, but we're having trouble uh, testing them out because we just don't have any support. We don't, teachers don't have time. We need a situation where we can try some innovative things uh, for teaching reading and math and all the other subjects with, with Hawaiian children. And he said, well, hey, why don't you give me a proposal? You know, send along something. So I well, that, would, yeah, I was well, I'm overwhelmed, actually. Yes, I mean, what a gift. Because, I mean, but even though there are all these imped impediments and complexities, still, when you got that option, that opportunity, then what were you thinking you were going to be able to do with those findings in the school setting? 
So having now talked about the challenges of it, so what what did you see, or, and and you with your colleagues, uh, that uh, well, me, okay, well, talk to, I'm okay. sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I will jump right to the idea then. I hustled right back to the university and went to see my new colleague Roland Tharp. Yeah. And I said, Roland, you've done some big projects before. Listen to this, and we came up with the idea. Well, how about we propose to the Kamehameha schools that they launch a research effort that will make them the primary expert. The, the uh, Kam schools would know more about teaching Native Hawaiian than any other in the world. And when that information is developed, it's, give, it's given away to the public schools. And that was the proposal we took to Jack and then eventually went to the trustees and eventually it was funded. And that's how the Kamehameha Early Education or Elementary Education Lab School came to be built. Well, that and, is, yeah. And I, that I, was 1971, but that's another whole story. That's the next step of the story. And that's getting on the road quickly, even more quickly to some success. I mean, you already had a success story in the Nanakuli study where there are these findings and then you're projecting to what could be done with those findings to bring some success in the other category of education and improving the public schooling of these Hawaiian youngsters. Well, so that, we're, we're kind of running that's out. That's what of we told. Water. Yeah. That's what we told the trustees. Yeah. Hey, we learned a lot in Nanakuli about Hawaiian culture. Let's see if we can make use of it. Yes. And so we're getting out of time and we'll have to wrap up. And um, I'm going to say I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and this is the State of the State of Hawaii on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking remotely with Dr. Ronald Gallimore about an early statehood study of Hawaiian community and culture on the Leeward Coast. Since this work led to Hawaii topping the nation's education agenda, for how to improve school success for Hawaiian and other minor minority students. The rest of the success story is to tell in another show. And of course, as a hint, and Ron's already given us the hint, the Kamehameha Early Education Program developed from the Leeward Coast study uh, to become a nationally recognized success story for Hawaiian youngsters' education. So thank you so much, uh, Ron Gallimore, and I will see you and I will see all of you in the audience again on the next State of the State in Hawaii. And mahalo for your attention, everyone.